students, let's have now lecture eight on Dante's The Divine Comedy 2019. This canticle will be the inferno. We're going to talk about cantos 10 to 13 today. The title of the lecture is Heresy, part two, the structure of lower hell, and an introduction to violence. But briefly, I want to touch on a couple things from last time. Remember, circle six is heresy. It is a liminal circle because it is sort of on the border of upper hell and lower hell. We don't really know how to categorize it. The reason why we don't know how to categorize it is it is outside Aristotle's categorical system because Aristotle himself existed four centuries before Christianity. We'll talk more about specifically Christian sins as we continue to go like blasphemy uh, as we get through um, uh, and simony as we get through circles 7 and 8. In any case, remember that the men here burn endlessly in flaming tombs and that two specific ones you need to know are the Ghibelline, Farinata degli Uberti, who we talked about last time, who twice expelled Guelphs from the city of Florence in 1248 and then at Monteperti in 1260, it says it right there. And um, also remember that the second person sharing a tomb with that fairy Nata is Cavalcante di Cavalcanti, the father of Dante's former best friend, Guido Cavalcanti. Guido Cavalcanti, whom he wrote a poem about loving so very, very much, wishing that they could forever be best friends. And then sadly, we know that their relationship did slowly deteriorate, and Dante was in fact one of the people who voted to exile his best friend, his former best friend then, I imagine, who then died the very same year he was exiled of malaria. I want you just to have a moment of pathos here. We use a lot of logos. We use a lot of our mind. Just think about how you feel. Probably you have some friends now in high school who aren't as good of friends as they were in elementary school. In fact, let's just see. Any show of hands? Anybody have a best friend in elementary school who's no longer their best friend? Yeah, a lot of people. So you know that things change. Even still, would you want to feel in any way responsible for that person dying? Probably not. Probably you still have some affection for that person and some good memories. So I want you to imagine how it must have felt for Dante to feel responsible to some extent for the death of his friend. And then also to write about his friend. Here, who was very much dead by the time he was writing this, though his friend had not died by 1300. Um, so, you know, something to keep in mind, I think that emotional connection is important. Remember also that there is a group of Greek philosophers down here who were called Epicureans based on the Greek philosopher called Epicurus. He believed that the soul was mortal and therefore died with the body. And so, if there is no immortality of the soul, if there's no heaven, no hell, there's only life. How should one live? Well, he believed you should live for pleasure. He was a so-called hedonist. And so he said, you should just live for the, the pleasures of the vine, which is wine. And uh, in vino veritas is, its, uh, is the very famous Latin phrase, in wine, truth. Which is probably not actually true, but maybe it's true. It sort of depends on how you look at things. Um, in any case, these... Uh, followers of Epicurus are down amongst the heretics because they believed the wrong thoughts, led to the wrong way of living, led to a terrible afterlife where they are burning eternally. In any case, let's talk now not about Farinata, but about Cavalcanti right after we mention one interesting thing that the dead can do. You need to know this term. They can see the future. Hyperopia is the name of the term. Why is it important to know that they can see the future? Two reasons. A, they can tell Dante about a terrible thing that is happening in his future. In 1302, what is happening in Dante the Pilgrim's future that Dante the Poet has already experienced since he's writing it between 1308 and 1321 about an event, a vision, that happened in 1300, yes? He's getting exiled. He will be exiled, right. And so they will constantly reference to him. In fact, Farinata will bring it up to him that he is going to be exiled. Brunetto Latini will later, later in Canto 15, his former teacher and also the teacher of Guido, say the same thing. And I always think it's very interesting that Dante gets to meet Guido because that, uh, uh, that means that the students of Dante were not, or excuse me, the students of Brunetto were not all of equal ability. Apparently he had a Dante, which means he had the greatest possible student you can even imagine. And as a teacher, I would say, the, the greatest possible student I can even imagine. 
Because that's a student who far excels the teacher. In any case, another reason I want you to know about hyperopia is that it helps you to know just how impotent, that means powerless, the souls in hell are. Because though they can see the future approaching, what can not they do? Yes? They can't do anything to change it. They can do nothing to change it. And besides the fact that they're dead, what is yet another reason that they cannot change it, even though they can see it, since we know that they are pure sensation down in the underworld? Yes? Is that they can't deny intelligence? Since they lack the good of the intellect, they can't even change their mind about the future. Which is, you all have often asked, why is it the case that the souls never get used to their punishments? It's like, think about it. If you, what is it that allows you to get used to physical torment? It's your mind realizing and changing with your circumstances. And so if you lose your mind, then you're purely sensation, then every sensation is what? totally equal. And if the sensation is being whipped by a demon, or burning in a flaming tune, or existing in a, 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 like, essentially a river of boiling pitch, then when do you ever not feel pure excruciating pain? Answer is never. Right. Because you never get used to anything because you don't have the thing that gets used to things. Which is your mind. Huh. Interesting. In any case, let's move forward. Cavalcanti de Cavalcanti, the second heretic that we find in one burning tomb, which we've allegorically interpreted as Florence, because it has one Guelph, one Ghibelline, and it shows the factional division between these two and their inability to see each other's side. In fact, if I were to ask you a clever question here, which punishment from upper hell does this punishment resemble with two people from different sides not recognizing each other's perspective? I'll give you like three seconds to think about this. Yes? Um, the circle? The circle? Okay, which, uh, which, which circle? Was there a circle on which people were p pushing boulders circle in four. semi-circles? Circle four, right. The money grubbers and the wasters. Very good. I think it's very similar here. You're starting to notice that part of being in hell is not seeing. Not seeing something about yourself. Not seeing something about others. Not understanding the universe itself. That's important. Very interesting. In any case, Cavalcanti, he was not a Ghibelline. Farinata was. And Farinata was a very powerful Ghibelline. Who is your family? He asked. Well, Cavalcanti to Cavalcanti is a Guelph. Very different. And, in fact, he was the father of Dante's best friend Guido Cavalcanti. And his son Guido married Farinata's daughter. And that potentially is part of the reason why Guido had to be exiled, because of his alliance, even though he was a Guelph, with a Ghibelline. I don't know the exact reason. I can look that up for you, though. Now, while Dante is speaking to Cavalcanti, Cavalcanti continually makes incorrect assumptions about why Dante is there. And he says, why isn't my son with you? Why, why is it because... It couldn't be because of talent... Or rather, he says, if it is because of talent that you are not, or that you are here, why is my son not here? And Dante has to explain to him, I'm not here because of great talent. I'm here because I was in a dark forest and I was about to do something terrible. It's because of my waywardness. And so there's a false assumption there. And again, that's part of why souls are in the inferno. Precisely because they do not use the good of the intellect, but make false assumptions about things. Dante then will later ask Farinata to pass along to Cavalcanti that his son is not actually dead at that moment. Even though, and this is sort of confusing, Guido is dead when Dante is writing the Divine Comedy, but he is not dead as of 1300 when the Divine Comedy is set. Remember, if a person is not yet dead by 1300, they are not going to be in the afterlife. That includes Pope Boniface VIII, who uh, will die just a few years after 1300. After being utterly humiliated and actually kidnapped. Uh, <laughs> in any case, that's Cavalcanti. I just want you to know that he made some inappropriate assumptions. I think I have a couple quotes by him at some point, but what I want to talk about now is the structure of this, the structure of the underworld. Because Virgil will take Canto, um, I believe it's 11, yes, Canto 11 to talk about it. And the first thing that happens is that they notice this terrible smell. And it's awful. And so when there's something terrible uh, accosting 
your sense of smell, you, you've got to take some time to get used to it. And they can get used to it because they have the good of the what? Yes? The intellect, right. <coughs> but the soul's in hell, it's always as bad as it's ever been. So they can't even think. Dante then takes a moment with Virgil to take refuge behind the tomb of Pope Anastasius II. The reason why it's important to see this pope is just because you now see that popes, the, the greatest figures, the earthly representations of God on earth for medieval Catholics, can also make it into the inferno, which means that the corruption in the world goes to the top possible levels. Which means that this world is going to be cleaned up. It's not going to be cleaned up by the elites, the popes, or the kings. We'll see both popes and kings down in hell, as well as emperors. It's going to take somebody else. Perhaps somebody like a Dante. Perhaps Dante is like a proto-democrat. I mean somebody who lives in a democracy. Because he takes it on himself to clean up the ways of the world. He takes personal responsibility for everything that is happening. Which is interesting. In any case, let's talk about this structure just a little bit. I have Aristotle here. Oh yeah, and I have some quotes from his ethics where he talks about incontinence and malice and brutishness, but we don't really have time to go through those. Let's talk about this schematic of lower hell. Let's focus first on the next circles. Violence. This is important. First and foremost, I want you to know that every circle in hell is concentric. That means they share the same center. That means as you go down, the circles get smaller. That's why we go to the left constantly, which is counter, which is clockwise. And um, if you don't think it's clockwise because you think you go left and right, then you are not reorienting yourself as you go in a circle. Think about it. As you're going in a circle, what stays to your left? The wall that you're going along. And so, while you're going left, does its orientation change in relation to you? No. So it always stays to your what? So you're always going which direction? Clockwise. Clockwise is what we call it. In any case, that means that at the bottom of hell is the very center of hell. And so the source of all the circles of hell, all the evil in hell, is actually Satan, once called Lucifer. Yes, very interesting. In any case, the next circles are, and we've just actually gone through this one, heresy, and then the three sub-circles of violence. The three sub-circles of violence are violence against others. There will be a boiling river of blood called Phlegathon there. That is the third river. So we know Acheron, river one. We know um, Styx, river two. And we know Phlegathon, river three. And I'll even tell you river four, which is frozen. Cocytus, or Cocytus, depending on whether you say it latinically or in an Anglican or American way. The second sort of sin, violence against the self. This is two parts. One is self-harm through suicide. One is self-harm through squandering one's property. Because Dante's belief is that you can that part of yourself is not only your physical part, but also your property as well. And we seem to honor that too, because if you take a book from me, I say that you what it from me. So and have reduced me in some way. It's sort of like a, a hearkening back to the idea of uh, Time and the Garros from the ancient Greek world. Remember that their idea of honor was actually physical. If I have more concubines than you, and more cows, I have more honor than you, as well as more wealth. And I would say that our current notions aren't so different. They're just a little bit more abstract. In any case, the third circle, which is itself split into three types of sin, specific sin, is violence against God, art, and nature. And in that place, we will find blasphemers, sodomites, and usurers. So... Three, three, three. Very good. All right. Beneath that, we will find circle eight of fraud. Simple fraud. Simple fraud is distinguished from complex fraud, and that simple fraud is when you betray someone that you do not have a relationship with. <coughs> so if you go to a random gas station, and you steal something from that gas station attendant, and you don't know them, that's simple fraud. Whereas circle nine will be complex fraud, when you betray somebody with whom you do have a special relationship. Whether it be your guest, your proper lord, a family member, etc. In any case, circle 8 is subdivided into 10 additional bolgias. That's the Italian word for it. 
we translate bulges usually into pockets or ditches. Think about it. It's like a ditch. It's like a grave in which we put people. And in those ten bulges or pockets are panderers and seducers. That's another two-part sin. We'll talk about that, I think, by the end of next lecture. Flatterers, simoniacs, I'll teach you what those are. They're people who sell religious offices. Sorcerers, baritors, hypocrites, thieves, deceivers, sowers of discords, and false fires. And at the bottom of eight, we will meet giants. And those giants, in fact, one in particular, the only one who could speak, will pick up Dante and Virgil in his hand, which he could then use to crush them, but probably will not, and will place them down in circle nine. Circle nine, we will find our fourth river. As I mentioned, it is frozen as opposed to the boiling river of blood, which is Phlegathon amongst the violent, because they were violent and their blood was boiling. They had a rather heated way of looking at things. Well, here we find the cold people, the people whose uh, veins or the blood that runs through their veins is ice cold. The people who say cold things and use their minds in a cold, malicious way without the warmth of affection for those for whom they should care. So you start to see the sort of contrapasso for both Circle 9 and for Circle 7. There. In any case, Circle 9 is itself split into four areas. Caina, for those who harm their family members, named after Cain, who murdered his brother Abel. It was the very first human in existence outside of Eden. Antonora, named uh, most likely for Antonor from the Iliad, uh, <coughs> having himself suggested that Menelaus and Odysseus be killed when they were guests in Troy, requesting or demanding Helen back. Ptolemaea, there are a couple different Ptolemies it could be for. Um, but probably from an Egyptian king, um, and we'll talk about that soon. That is for people who betray their, um, which one is it? Uh, is it their political rivals? I I'll think about it when we get there in any case. And then the fourth, Judeca, those who, that is those who betray the rightful lord. Actually, let me look at this schematic really quickly for some help. Ptolemaea, ah, murderers of guests, whereas Antonio are traitors to political party or country. We'll talk about that when we get there. In any case, you now know the structure of lower hell. You know about heresy, circle six. You know about the three parts to circle seven. You know about the ten parts to circle eight. And you know about the four parts to circle nine. Be expecting those. And so, let's start with talking about the murderers, the highway robbers, and the tyrants. Let's go to circle seven, sub-circle one, canto twelve, the river of boiling blood, Phlegathon, where again the murderers, highway robbers, and tyrants are. Now, the circles of violence, violence against others. As I told you, this, these sinners are submerged in a river of boiling blood. Probably, well, it would be interesting to think about, is this the blood that they spilled of others, or is this the boiling blood that led to them spilling the blood of others? Something interesting about this punishment. The more violent you were, and the more blood you spilled, the higher you are submerged in the water, in, uh, or excuse me, in the liquid, the boiling blood. So, if you were just a small-time murderer or robber, you might be submerged up to your ankles. But if you were, say, a tyrant and responsible for the death of hundreds or thousands, you could be submerged up over your chin, up over your nose. While you are submerged, if you try and get out even for a moment, there are centaurs patrolling the edges of this river who will shoot arrows at you. So, if you try and get away from your pain, you will be rewarded with additional what? Pain! Exactly. Exactly. And two of the major characters that are here are two great tyrants. Uh, some might call one of them a conqueror. Alexander the Great who was himself a student of Aristotle. He was a Hellenistic king, seemed to conquer the known world, and existed between the time of the greatness of ancient Greece, really Athens and Sparta, and the Roman Empire. It was actually after the Hellenistic Empire fell, and I believe it was about 146 BCE, I'll have to check that date, that the Romans really attained their, uh, their uh, supremacy. In any case, the second character, Dionysus the Tyrant, is a little bit less important. He was the teacher of Plato, and Plato was actually invited by him to Sicily to help govern 
the city, but um, there were disagreements between Plato and Dionysus. Dionysus ended up imprisoning Plato. He talks about this in his seventh letter. And then uh, Plato actually had to send letters to his friends to uh, break him out so that he could escape, which he did. Many people consider this a major fail failure of Plato, who wrote a major political work called The Republic, and then also one called The Laws, and they said, well, doesn't look like he could implement it in the world. Which is, I think, an interesting criticism. Uh -hmm. Hmm. Was there one other thing that I wanted to say about this? No, I think I'll say it next. All right. Something I want you to notice about the creatures <coughs> amongst the violent is that they are themselves symbols of violence. They are themselves abominations. They are hybrids. There are three sorts of creatures we see. First, we see the centaurs. Actually, first, even before the centaurs, we see the minotaur. Then we see the centaurs. And then, amongst the suicides, we will see the harpies. Well, think about it. What's a minotaur? It's half bull, half human. And actually, we know that it was created through the uh, unholy alliance of the wife of Minos, Pasiphae, and a bull. Uh, well, the centaurs, they were supposedly made out of clouds, but they are themselves an unholy alliance of, of um, horse and man and are known to be rather drunk and violent. And in fact, the most famous story about them, which is called the Lapiths and the Centaurs, um, they uh, attempt to abduct a bride right after she has been married when they are at the, the party afterwards, the uh, reception we would call it, and after they have drink. And then the harpies we know, of course, have the faces of women and then the bodies of foul birds with feces all over their uh, chests. Yuck. So each one of these mythological characters is itself an act of violence on the idea of man. Each of them is animal in some way, as if, ah, you're starting to see, as if to be violent means to give up pieces of your humanity, of your intellect, in order to do something animal to someone else, particularly to do what to them? Yes? Harm. Harm, right? It's like doing harm to someone else is sacrificing a piece of your own humanity. It's almost like Plato was right. Who do you do most harm to when you harm someone else through denying your own humanity and acting like an animal? Yes, yourself. Yourself and your own soul. Yes, that does seem to be very much the idea here. And so uh, we are going to run into a couple specific centaurs. You need to know their names. They are Nessus as well as Chiron uh, as well as Pholus. You don't really need to know Pholus as much. He's He's much smaller in uh, the mythology. But do remember Nessus. Uh, Nessus is important because he is the centaur that was killed by Heracles, who then gave his uh, tunic to Heracles' uh, then wife, Megara, who then gave that tunic thinking it was a love uh, potion, that it had a love spell on it, to Heracles. And on that tunic was Hydra blood, which was there from Heracles' arrow, which he shot Nessus with when he tried to abduct Megara. And then when Heracles put that tunic onto himself, the Hydra blood was still on there, and that ended up eating through his skin and leading to his demise. Remember, Chiron is very famous because he's sort of opposite from a normal centaur. Instead of trying to abduct women like the Lapis and Nessus, he teaches Achilleus how to speak, how to fight, how to hunt, how to play the lyre. He's very different. He seems to maintain his, his, uh, his humanity in some way. And actually, he's immortal, but unfortunately, he is later struck by an arrow, I believe, by Heracles, which leads to eternal pain with him, and he gives up his immortality so that he can die because of the pain that he is immortally in. In any case, I thought I would say that to you, just because uh, those are interesting stories. Good. The Minotaur. Um, I'm just going to say a couple facts about him so that you can know them. And then we're going to end. This is where we'll end today. The Minotaur also has an interesting mythology behind him. As you know, he is the son of Minos, technically the stepson, because he comes from the coupling of a white bull with Pasiphae. You say, how did that happen? Supposedly, the great inventor Daedalus, who made the labyrinth, as well as the wings for Icarus, his son, and himself, um, supposedly, he created a bull sort of effigy or suit that then... <laughs> that uh, then... Uh, Pasiphae, 
I, I know I say her name in different ways. It's because other people say her name in different ways. Got into so that she coupled with the bull. The bull was then produced. Minos, of course, was horrified by the fact that there was a bull-headed child of his. He then had Daedalus create a labyrinth, which the bull lived in, and seven Athenian youths would be sacrificed to every year. The reason youths were being sacrificed is because there had been a war between Athens and Crete, and the true legitimate son of Minos had died in that. And so because he endured the death of his son, so would many Athenians endure the deaths of their sons. And then a minor Duke of Athens, mythological character from Greece or the ancient Greek mythology, came to the labyrinth. And do you recall who it was who defeated the Minotaur? We talked about him as a character not as great in the mythology as Hercules recently. Yes? It was Theseus that killed, slayed the Minotaur. Very, very good. All right, so today we've talked about heresy, part two, talking about Cavalcanti to Cavalcanti. We've talked also about hyperopia and the ability for the souls to see the future but not change it because A, they don't have the good of the intellect, B, they don't have bodies, and C, they are dead, so they can't do anything. Um, we talked about the structure of dis, lower hell, the three parts to circle seven, the ten parts to circle eight, the four parts to circle nine, and then we talked about the first part of Circle 7. The Boiling River of Blood Phlegathon, River 3 of the Inferno. We talked about the three abominations. We'll find there the hybrids, harpies, in Circle uh, 7.2, Canto 13, Minotaur, and Centaurs. We talked specifically about how the Minotaur was first created and the mythology underlying him and who killed him, Theseus. We also talked about two, three specific centaurs, Pholus, Nessus, and Chiron. In particular, you need to know about Chiron, the teacher of Achilles, as well as Nessus, the would-be abductor of Heracles' second wife, Megara. His first one, I believe, was Dei Idamea, but I can fix that for you if that is wrong.